It was mentioned earlier, but uh, I'm Mark. I'm one of the elders here at Refuge. And uh, I'm, I'm just blessed to get an opportunity to preach on occasion. So thank you very much. I did hear very clearly James's admonition about teaching right. So that's, that's you know, up in my nervous level a little bit now. But uh, um, the text I'm preaching on today, even though it's really just 10 verses, it's very, very dense and very, very important. And in fact, we're actually scheduled to go on to chapter four next week. James, after hearing me preach, may say, well, Mark, you missed a couple things. And he may preach on it again. So just be aware, it, there's so much in here. And, uh, but before we go into, day, into today's scripture, let me review kind of where, we've, uh, where we are and what we've covered since we started this Roman series. Well, so far, Romans is really seen as a looming pronouncement from Paul. The wrath of God is revealed. We have no excuse for not recognizing God. And there are times when God, either corporately or individually, just gives us over as he would give over enemies to Israel. And sometimes if we condone sin, it's almost as bad as actually committing those sins ourselves. You know, we also learned that uh, affiliation, hey, I'm a member of Refuge, that doesn't save us. Works, even though they are manifestations of faith, they don't save us. Rituals, like, hey, I, Come on, I went to church every Sunday, I gave my tithe, I did this, I did that. The rituals don't save either. And we learned that a very real judgment day is coming. So, the kicker, this is us. Under the law, we are dead. Absolutely dead. This is what the law does. So if we go back, and uh, in, in your bulletins, you'll have the whole uh, Bible Prophets graphic there, but this is where we are now. We're up to this point. Um, God's righteousness is revealed. The gospel is stated. And we're trapped. We're guilty. And even more guilty. That's where we are. That's where James left us off, I think, three weeks ago. Now, as we move into this next section of Romans, there are a couple points I want you to consider. Now, Paul, including this book of Romans, authored 13, some would say 14, of the books in the New Testament. Romans is unique in a couple of ways. First, it's the only letter that Paul wrote to a church or churches that he did not start. It's also, um, if you look at the letters that he writes in some of the other books, like sometimes to individuals, it's really the only letter that doesn't address a specific issue or issues for the audience that he's, that he's um, writing to. So this letter doesn't address those kind of specific issues. And Romans, in fact, is the letter that has the most complete explanation of Paul's theology. That's the study of God. It is a letter to demonstrate the power of this theology and his ability to teach it in preparation for carrying the gospel on to Rome and further to Spain. That's what he had hoped. In a sense, it is the one letter that puts all the pieces together. He's laying the groundwork for a successful trip and making the case that he is a legitimate apostle and teacher of the gospel. Now, I would hope you would all agree with me in that our Lord Jesus Christ was very intentional. He was intentional in what he said. And he was intentional on who he chose for his apostles. Paul was not chosen by accident. Before his conversion, Paul, then known as Saul, was a Pharisee of Pharisees who intensely persecuted the followers of Jesus. Says Paul himself in, in Galatians, for you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Going on from Acts, 
the, the depiction of his actual trans, uh, his conversion. He was traveling towards Damascus when, from the scriptures, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus, and for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Now, the conversion of Paul, in spite of his attempts to completely eradicate Christianity, is seen as the evidence of the power of divine grace. Where no fall is so deep that grace cannot descend to it, and no height is so lofty that grace cannot lift the sinner to it. It also demonstrates God's power to use everything, even the hostile persecutor, to achieve the divine purpose. And there's another angle of Paul's uniqueness that I want to point out. Paul was an expert in the law, the Jewish scriptures. In order to give you some idea of what a Pharisee's Pharisee is, or what it means, it has been said that a Pharisee could take a pin and pierce it into the Torah and tell you what word was on the 20th page, or the 18th page, or the 30th page. That's how deep their learning was around the Jewish scripture. You might say, oh, that's impossible. That's just a wives' tale. But remember, back in those days, the, the written word was the exception. And there was a lot more emphasis on memorization and teaching uh, tradition vocally. Now, who else would have been in a better position to understand Christ's fulfillment of the law. Can you imagine how Saul or Paul's mind must have been racing in those three days that he was struck blind? Can you imagine the eureka moments he must have had as he connected the dots? Oh, that's what that Isaiah prophecy meant. Oh, can you imagine so the text we've covered so far, while important in its own right, is moving us to the main point that Paul wants to establish in this part of his letter, the availability of God's righteousness to all who respond in faith. And isn't, that is fantastic news, isn't it? Amen. Amen. Thank you. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now that's actually, that is the good news. It's stated, it was stated back in chapter 1, verse 17. And it's elaborated today in this text. And like I just indicated, this is, this is worth rejoicing. The essential points are packed in the first part of today's text. The first few verses, a, a passage that Martin Luther called the chief point and the very central place of the apostle and of the whole Bible. Did you hear what I just said? Martin Luther considered this the chief point of the whole Bible. I think we need to pay attention. And as I said before, if I don't get it right, James will cover it later. Um, you may be familiar with a word cloud. They're created by putting text into a program and and then the program creates a graphic that uh, highlights important words in the text. Ben has actually been posting word clouds for each piece of our, our scripture in Romans on our Facebook page. And I thought I'd just share the one Ben created for today's text. You can see right here the t some of the terms that I'm going to be explaining. And you can see they're important. So uh, before I start diving in more... Let's listen to the scripture for today. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. 
for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time, so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith, apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is He not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Very good news. Starts out with, but now. And I'm going to pause on this for a minute. Anytime you see that phrase being used, we are moving from the past to the present. So I'll go back just and uh, show the verse or uh, talk the verse just preceding this. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. No person can gain a standing with God through works, because no one is able to perform works to the degree needed to secure such a standing. This is what tormented Luther before he truly understood the power of the scripture that we're talking about today. He tried and he tried and he tried, and he knew it would never be enough. But now makes the shift in Paul's focus from the old era of sin's domination to the new era, era of salvation. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Okay, I'm going to dwell a bit on this word righteousness. I talked about this a bit in my previous sermon, you know, with my puny brain, everything I know, sense, understand, everything I, I visualize, it all happens inside this little skull. How can I possibly conceive of the one and only God? The God that created everything we see. The God that created uh, everything we don't see. God created everything. Even time. And, and our God is simultaneously aware, and aware is just too weak a word, but he's simultaneously aware of everything in the universe at every time in the universe. I love the way John Piper, in an introductory video to the New City Catechism a few weeks ago, talked about God's manifold perfection, really his glory. He's perfect from many, many different ways. And yet, our God is one that we can have a personal relationship with. All of us at the same time. This is a mind-blowing concept from my little puny human brain. So how in the world can I possibly know the true extent of this righteousness? Well, let's look at the definition of the word and see if it gives us a few clues. Okay, righteousness, the uh, call leader stating a right, a righteous con Okay, wait a minute. what's righteous? So let's, let's look at righteous. What is righteous? Uprightness, morality. This, this really still doesn't help me much. What is righteous? What really is it? You know, you might say, we, we understand the definition of, uh, you know, good and evil, and we have it inside us, and uh, do we really? Do we really know what righteous is? Now, if I were to say to you, hey, it's, it's, it's uh, nine or not three meters tall, what would that mean to you? How do we know how long a meter is? By this. 
The meter was developed in France in 1793. It was designed actually to be one ten millionth of the distance from the equator to the North Pole. I'm trying to use that definition, just it would be difficult in any age, much less the 1700s. So a physical meter was built. This is the meter. In fact, it might be a little hard to see, but there's two stops, one at either end. The distance between those two stops is the meter. Later, they made uh, standards out of metal and it evolved a bit, but this was what the original looked like. This is the standard against which metric measurements are determined. It's fundamental to building things described in the metric system. It is a standard not subject to debate. And there's a similar, if you're wondering, physical yard for our English system as well. And yet, how can we measure against our standard for righteousness? That's an important question to ponder. Let me give another example of a standard. For centuries, the standard of direction and navigation, aside from complicated uh, celestial navigation, was the magnetic North Pole. But the magnetic pole is not north on a map, which is true north. True north is the point where the Earth's axis goes through the Earth's surface, a theoretical thing, frankly. But not only is the magnetic pole not lined up with that, the magnetic pole is moving. You know, prior to 1990, the magnetic north pole was moving about 9.3 miles a year. Today, it's moving at about 34 miles per year. Now, the difference between true north and north on a compass from where we are now is 21 degrees east, meaning that the magnetic pole is 21 degrees east of true north. But that angle changes depending on where you're at. If you go to the east coast, it's different. But it's really important if you're trying to go north on a map that you understand that number. It's called declination. Well, think back to the question, what is righteous? What is our standard for righteousness? For that matter, for good, for love. Looking at definitions don't help. It's like saying, ah, the complete definition of a meter is a form of measurement. It's like a circular argument. No, I can't build anything to that. So I'll tell you the answer that some deny. God is the definition of righteousness. He is the standard for righteousness. Now God is not only our standard for measuring righteousness, love, etc., that we can build our life from, but is also our directional standard, our true north, to which we should be pointed. But as I pointed out earlier, you might say, we, we all know good from evil, we understand what is moral and upright, but do we? Not if we do not know God. Yes, God is our standard. How do we know God? Since he is the standard for morality, holiness, and we know we should strive to get closer to those standards, we need to know him and his righteousness. We need to find out as much about his manifold perfection as we possibly can. The better we know him, the clearer our vision of good, holiness, love, justice. You get the idea. If we don't know God, we're just flailing around, striving for something that we don't know or understand, frankly, in darkness. And one thing that really helps is that unlike the magnetic North Pole, our God is not a moving target. He has not moved. He is unchanging. There is no Old Testament God and a different or revised New Testament God. There aren't software updates downloaded to fix bugs. There's no God 2.0 because our secular culture has shifted. So, again, how do we know God? Stay tuned. I'm saving that for later. We do know that the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. God has shown his righteousness, but we still need to go deeper. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. This is only just a few words later, and the righteousness of God is repeated. If you think of the first instance of righteousness of God, 
as from uh, being the, on the God side, part of his nature. Douglas Moo, a uh, biblical commentator, suggests that this is from the human side. There's two transactions. There's a righteousness of God, but from the human side, it is through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. God's righteousness is available only through faith in Christ. But, and this is the good news, it's available to anyone who has faith in Christ. All who believe. Let's move on. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no distinction, as we might expect, has to do with the absence of any basic difference among people with respect to their standing before God. Jews may have the law. Americans, we may claim to our great religious heritage, if you will, kind of out of, out of focus or out of um, today's vernacular, but good people can point to their works of charity. But all of this, all of this makes essentially no difference to one standing before the righteous and holy God. We all fall short. Very, very short. Now the source of God's righteousness and the gracious provision of Christ as an atoning sacrifice is the theme of the next part of the, of the, of the, of the scripture. And are justified. Well, let's look at the word justified just a minute. Um, Paul uses the word justified for the first time in Romans to depict his distinctive understanding of Christian salvation. As Paul uses it in these contexts, the word justify means not to make righteous, nor simply to treat as righteous, but to declare righteous. God has declared those who believe as righteous, as only he can. He has made it so. And that, the second part of that, and are justified by his grace, as a gift. Grace is one of Paul's most significant theological terms in all his writing. He uses it typically not to describe the quality of God, but the way in which God has acted in Christ, unconstrained by anything beyond his own will. God's justifying verdict is totally unmerited. People have done and can do nothing to earn it. God, totally consistent with his nature, his righteousness, gave a gift through Jesus Christ. But we must receive it by faith. But justification is a matter of grace on God's side. It means that it must be a matter of faith on the human side. God's grace, our faith. You know, this is the most common Definition of grace that I, I've used it many, many times. You probably have heard unmerited favor. But I think I've found a, a better one, or at least a, an enhancement to this. Now, an acquaintance of mine that goes to Faith Community Church over in Edmonds, is also one in our denomination, in our classes, pointed to me, me to a podcast series by Michelle Nizak called More Than a Song. Nizak's goal is to inspire others to discover and meditate on God's Word using current Christian songs and their lyrics as a starting point. I've been listening to them um, quite a bit since then, and I really find them very good. So I wondered, could I find anything in one of those podcasts that would inform this sermon? And I think I hit pay dirt when re reviewing the one based on the Mercy Me song, Grace Got You. She highlighted a commentary by Alexander McLaren, a minister that lived from 1826 to 1910, and who also created some great commentaries. So I quote from Alexander's commentary on Titus, focusing on grace. Now that word grace played a much larger role in the thoughts of our fathers than it does in ours. And I'm not sure that many things are more needed by the ordinary Christian of this generation than, than that he should rediscover the amplitude and majesty of that old-fashioned and unfashionable word, grace. But keep in mind, he's writing this in the 1800s. So, for what does grace mean? It means a self-originated love. 
Grace is love that has no motive but itself. Grace is self-motivated love that is in full energetic exercise. Grace is a self-motive, ever-acting love that delights to impart. So I have a slightly modified, I like, like that self-motivated love. It takes a little bit beyond just a favor. It's truly God's love manifested. Now let's continue with the scripture. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption. All of these definitions really seem to apply. While the price connoted by the word redemption was paid at the cross in the blood of Christ, the redeeming work that the payment made possible is like justification applied to each person when he or she believes. Specifically, Paul now unfolds the nature and means of this redemption that is in Christ Jesus, showing that this redemption takes place at the will and initiative of God the Father. The prime doer in Christ's cross was God. Christ was God reconciling. He was doing, or he, he was God doing the very best for man, not man doing the very best for God. Whom God put forward as propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Don't let the word propitiation throw you. If you were a Pharisee or a Jew in that time, it would convey a really rich explanation, touching on sacrifices made at the mercy seat in blood on Yom Kippur and other uh, Jewish parallels. But for a simpler definition, propitiation is the act of satisfying God's wrath with Christ's sacrifice. Here's another quote from Douglas Moo, except that I replaced, replaced his words pagan and heathen with the word secular. First, as we have seen, the biblical con conception of the wrath of God is far removed from the secular picture of a capricious and often vindictive deity. God's wrath is the inevitable and necessary reaction of absolute holiness to sin. Second, in contrast to the secular religious tradition, it is God himself who initiates the perpetuary offering. In the secular view, expiation, and that means the way that which atonement is made, renders the gods willing to forgive. In other words, in the secular view, the sacrifice changes God's opinion. In, it, it, God, in, in the biblical view, expiation enables God, consistent with his holiness, to do whatever he, or what he has never been unwilling to do. In the former view, the secular view, sacrifice changes the sentiments of the gods toward men. In the latter, the biblical view, it affects or shows the consistency of his procedure in relation to sin. This is all in line with God's righteousness. God's wrath and grace are totally consistent with his righteousness. We move on. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now you've probably heard the adage about presentations. You tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. And when I read this part of the passage, um, frankly, this is God telling me, okay, Mark, I'm telling you this again to let it sink into that puny brain because he's recovering the ground that we just talked about. Now, as I said earlier, Luther called this paragraph that we've been reviewing the chief point of the whole Bible because it focuses on what Luther thought was the heart of the Bible. Justification by faith. Luther believed that this article, this concept, was vital. If that article stands, the church stands. If it falls, the church falls. Hence the solos that we have hanging, by faith alone and by grace alone. 
With these phrases, the reformers expressed their conviction that justification is, from first to last, a matter of God's own doing, to which human beings must respond, but to which we can add nothing. Now, I'll briefly cover the remaining part of the text. And what becomes of our boasting? Now, could Paul be thinking about his own boasting as Saul before his conversion? I would suggest this, this was very personal to him. In commentary, I read, builds a case that the primary intended audience of this section is Jews. Paul highlights the exclusivity of faith, faith alone, and he makes a number of points clearly directed to a Jewish viewpoint. Faith excludes all boasting, provides for the inclusion of the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and complements rather than nullifying the law. By faith alone, there is no other way. The good news, it's open to all of us. It's open to anyone. There is no difference. Now, earlier when I talked about God's righteousness, I raised the question, left it hanging, and I said I'd get back to it. How do we know God? How can we understand his manifold perfection, our standard against which all is measured? Well, you might see, I see God in nature. Look at his magnificent creation. It is true that the world around us is his uh, creation, but does it really help us understand his character? I don't think so. You might say humans are in the image of God and therefore innately understand right from wrong, essentially saying, I know the standard from within myself. No, not at all. We should understand that our image of God is greatly corrupted. Now, the passage we've been studying certainly gives us clues on God's character. And to me, therein lies the answer. The character of God is reliably described in the Holy Bible, our scriptures. I truly believe that our Holy Bible is our only perfect guide for faith and practice. I can point you to man-made books as good guides for practice, but they don't really touch the faith I'm talking about. And besides, how would I know they're good practices unless I compare them to the Word? And if someone says, oh, the scriptures are changing to reflect a more modern image of God, like a moving magnetic North Pole. They're lying. More accurate translations to fit with changes in the current state of our language. Okay, I can buy that, but we have to be very careful going down that path. So I would like you to hear what I'm saying here. If you're not in the Word on a regular basis, you are living a risky lifestyle. Satan is very real. He's very smart. Think about it. What was the first sin? How was it tempted? Satan put doubt in Adam and Eve's minds. Oh, did God really mean that? Did God really say that? Satan is the father of lies. He's the original fake news creator. He lies about the character of God. Studying the Bible is the only way to understand the character of God and to sort out the truth from the lies. Now, do you have to be in the Word on a regular basis to be saved? No, I would never say that. I just countered it with what I talked about before. Faith alone, okay? But I would say that you're taking some risks. It's interesting. Ben has even told me recently, we've talked about some of these things, and he's, he has said he's probably going to be surprised by those he sees in heaven based on their theology, or I would say lack thereof. And he would, we would never say you aren't saved because you don't understand the theology that Paul is laying out in Romans or because you don't believe in concepts like election or, frankly, even if you believe in just Jesus Christ, but also think works gives you some sort of extra credit. I would never say you aren't saved because you uh, do or don't think that way. And for me, one of the best proofs is the criminal on the cross next to Jesus. You know, as I've been pondering or, or reflecting on this sacrifice, 
to address God's wrath and the way it was given with grace. I do visualize the two criminals on either side. So from Luke 23, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And our Lord and Savior said, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Amen. Now think of it. This criminal still believed. He saw Christ on the cross. He saw Christ dying, Christ dying. Even when his own disciples didn't understand, they were fleeing or denying. He believed, remember me. I think that's an amazing thing. He believed, and by the way, he had never heard of Calvin or Luther, either one of them. Now, so I would, I would never say, oh, you don't wear, you don't wear seat belts, so you're gonna die. No. But I would say you're increasing your risk. Likewise, I say you're living a risky lifestyle, as I said, if you're not in the word on a regular basis. You'll be more at risk in believing lies. And believe me, they're coming at us virtually every hour of every day. Let the Spirit speak to you through the word. If you are consistently coming to church and hearing us preach, that takes a little risk out, but is it enough? How would you know? whether the preaching is true. I make mistakes all the time. I know I made a bunch of mistakes already in this, in this sermon. But thankfully, I have elders, I have brothers and sisters in Christ, and I have my amazing wife, who has a very firm grip on Scripture, that hold me accountable. And I've been as careful as I could be to let the Scripture be my primary guide, while hard to li trying to listen to the Spirit. And that's where some of the content came from that you might not see right in the scripture. Today, though, just like we do virtually every, every day, we put the Holy Scripture right up in front of you so you can help discern when we might get off track. Now, I, I'm going to give you a chance to do some discernment here as I maybe go off track a little bit. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about the concept of works. And this, I, you'll, you'll understand more in a minute. But when I miss a sermon, which happens occasionally, I try to go back and listen to its podcast later. A couple of weeks ago, I was listening to James's sermon, Empty Yourself. It's a really good sermon. And I was thinking about the content of my sermon today, and I was pondering the relationship between faith and works. And my mind, maybe the spirit, took me to this. Back when I bought my iPad sec second generation, Apple offered free inscription of your name and a very limited text string on that, on the back of the iPad. I still have it to this day. I put, love God, love others. You, you, hopefully you kind of see that and recognize it as a very truncated version of the great commandment. And I'm going to read from Matthew 22, 34 through 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Love God love people. So clearly job number one is to love God. Not with just your heart, but with all your soul and all your mind. And by the way, if you're, are you really loving God without your, you know, with your, all your mind if you're not digging into the scriptures? Hmm. But with works, what we do, who are we really loving? Sure, works can be a form of glorifying God. We touched on that actually a little bit earlier. 
And this, you could say it's a form of loving God. Does, does God need our works? No, he's complete. Does God gain anything from our works? No. He has nothing to gain at all. He is manifold perfection. I would instead suggest that works are primarily a form of loving people. And I think they're very important. And they are a result of faith and believing. But they're not double, number one. So now, back to our scripture, I'm going to, in summary, this is the way the graphic kind of takes us as a summarization. But now, those of us that believe are declared by God to be righteous, justified, and because of that, we have a new status. We're right with God, and we're forgiven. It is so. It is declared. We have a new family. We are now included in God's people. It's not limited to Israel or some part of humanity. And because of all this, we have a new future, a transformed life. And this is only possible in Christ. And back to an earlier slide. We have escaped from under the house that came tumbling down on us from Kansas. We believe. So before I close and pray, I, I do want to give some credits. Um, I actually thought I'd try and do an enrolling credit thing. I thought I might get some extra points from James, but yeah, no, not really. But I do want to do a couple things because this sermon th thing, giving sermons, is a very new thing to me. And first of all, I want to thank James and I want to thank Ben. Um, they've been great inspirations for me, and uh, I learn a lot just simply by listening to them. And they've also given me a lot of great suggestions. I uh, leaned a lot on uh, commentators, Douglas Moo, Alexander McLaren, and Matthew Henry. And I leaned most heavily on Moo's and his commentary on Romans. If you want some light reading someday, he's got a 900 plus page book on Romans. Um, I also give credit to Michelle Nizap, the creator of the podcast More Than a Song. I think she's doing really good work there. But most of all, I, I, I believe and I hope and give credit to the Holy Spirit. Because as I spent time uh, meditating over this sermon, I have realized things that I, I did not know before. So I'll close from a, with a quote from Matthew Henry's concise commentary on this passage. Must guilty man remain under wrath? Is the wound forever incurable? No. Blessed be God, there is another way laid open for us. This is the righteousness of God, righteousness of his ordaining and providing and accepting. It is by that faith which has Jesus Christ for its object, an anointed Savior, so Jesus Christ signifies. Justifying faith respects Christ as a Savior in all his three anointed offices, as prophet, priest, and king. Trusting in him, accepting him, and cleaving to him. And all these Jews and Gentiles are alike welcome to God through Christ. There is no difference. His righteousness is upon all that believe. Not only offered to them, but put upon them as a crown, as a robe. It is free grace, mere mercy. There is nothing in us to deserve such favors. It comes freely unto us, but Christ bought it and paid the price. And faith has special regard for the blood of Christ as that which made the atonement. God in all this declares his righteousness. It is plain that he hates sin when nothing less than the blood of Christ would satisfy for it. And it would not agree with his justice to demand the debt when the surety has paid it. And he has accepted that payment in full satisfaction. Let's pray. Well, Father God, we just thank you. Thank you for this good news. Because as it looked so bleak, and we see ourselves crushed by the law, with no way out, the good news is there is. 
But the price has been paid. Those of us that believe we are declared righteous and whole. Wow. We just thank you so much for that. The key point of the very of the gospel. We ask, and I ask, Lord, that um, hopefully these words uh, touch some people, maybe made some clarification. If not, I just accept the way that the Spirit is acting. We ask for you to guide everything that we do as we go forward. Inform us in all of our decisions. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.